Today we're going to be speaking concerning 1 Kings. And since 1 Kings is a large book, we're going to pick a particular chapter. And that chapter is going to be 18. And it's a story in which, you know, um, in all actuality, you know, uh, I was reading when Yah told me that Obadiah was my name. Hallelujah. So, he does occur in this passage of scripture. Uh, and we're going to talk about him a little bit, the servants of Yah. You know, because, you know, I'm not the only Obadiah in here. I, I pray I'm not the only Obadiah in here. I pray there's some other servants in here as well. I mean, some other servants of Yah. You know, if not in name, at least in character. Amen? Amen. You know, and, you know, we're going to talk about a little bit about the caves. Obadiah's the cave. Because he, you know, he, he done some, you know, some things up in, in the cave. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. I thought this was just the coolest picture of a cave, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I had to throw that in there. I, you know, it was just a cool picture of a cave. I, I kind of like caves. So, you know, um, this was a real cool cave here. So, all right, say goodbye to the cool cave. Let's jump right in. 1 Kings 18, 1 through 4, my first reader, please. Oh, yeah, pass off the mic. And it came to pass, after many days, that the word of Yahuwah came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared Yahuwah greatly. For it was so, when Jezebel cut off the prophets of Yahuwah, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets, and hid them by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water. Hallelujah. Okay, let's define some of these terms here. Let's see. First we have Eliyah, or um, Eliyahu, if you will, um, which simply means... My L is Yah. Hallelujah. What an awesome name. You know, you know, he and, and he truly walked in his name, did he not? You know, um, my L is Yah, Ahab, uh, we learned from the other day, brother of my father, Samaria, speaks to a watch station. And then we have um Obadiah, servant of Yah, Jezebel, unchaste, or husband is Bel. And we have the number 100 um, that actually uh, speaks to the election of grace or the children of promise. You know, so uh, let's take a, uh, a deeper look at this, you know, from a spiritual perspective. And we see that it came to pass after many days that the word of Yahuwah came unto Eliyah, or Eliyahu, in the third year. You know, so this is the third year of famine. In, in our actuality, when there was uh, a great drought, you know, Eliyahu had um, professed that there was going to be drought in the earth, and so it was, and, you know, because he was the prophet of Elohim, and Yah would not let his words fall to the ground. And there was a drought for three years, and after the third year, you know, after the third year, you know, this is, this is when this takes place. And in a sense, you know, you know, it's, it's even, um, you know, uh, can be parallel that we're in the third year of a sort. You know, it's been over 2,000 years since Messiah has, uh, has left, and we're in the third something, you know, uh, you know, from the time that the Messiah was lifted up. You know, but here it is, it's saying, go show thyself unto Ahab, and, uh, or the brother of my father. 
Now, spiritually speaking, this could speak to, you know, um, one of the brethren, you know, such as uh, the Yahudim, you know, our father being the Messiah, one of the brethren would be a Yahudim, you know, uh, or an Israelite, you know, if you would, uh, seeing that he was from two kingly lines, you know. Um, but here it is. Verse 2 says that Eliyahu went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Samaria means a um, watch station. So, you know, the famine was very sore. You know, everyone's watching now, you know, and here comes um, Eliyahu, Yah, sending him into this type of situation. You know, and ultimately, you know, I do believe that this speaks to uh, uh, the latter the last, the last days, the latter times um, of Yah's plan, in which uh, pretty much the same thing will, will transpire again. You know, Scripture teaches us uh, that Eliyah would come prior to the coming back of the Messiah, and you know we went over that a couple of days ago. But uh, here it is: we see verse three said, and Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his household. Um, ruler of his house, and Obadiah feared Yahuwah greatly. For it was so that when Jezebel cut off the prophets of Yahuwah, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water. And I forgot to put fifty up here, but um, the number fifty speaks to the Holy Spirit. It's, it also speaks to freedom. You know, speaks to the Holy Spirit, speaks to freedom. Um, speaks to... Jubilee, which um, also speaks to freedom. Uh, so here it is. We have a spiritual picture of the servant of Yah. You know, during a time when when Jezebel or when the unchaste or the one that is that is um, um, a husband to Baal, and we spoke of um, Jezebel previously as, as being a, de a depiction of, of the whore of Babylon. In our actual, actuality, or you know, uh, and here it is. We see that we have this unchaste one that's that's trying to kill off all the prophets of Elohim, and she was doing a very effective job. So much so that Eliyahu thought he was the last one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so she was doing a very effective uh, job. And here it is. It says, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of Yahuwah that Obadiah, the servant of Yah, took an hundred prophets. The, um, the number 100 represents Elohim's grace, his yeah. election of grace. It represents his children of promise. So here it is. We see that the servant of Yah takes Elohim's election of grace. He takes his children of promise. And he hides them by 50 in a cave. You know, 50 speaking to liberty, you know, even in the time in which they were being persecuted, he showed them their liberation. He showed them liberty. He showed them um, uh, a place of refuge. You know, and I really do believe that this is a spiritual picture of the servant of Yah taking Elohim's election of grace, his children of promise, and 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 Showing them the way out of bondage, you know, showing them the way out of bondage to death, you know, and here it is through the Ruach HaKodesh or the Holy Spirit, you know, he, he uh, hides them in a, in a cave and, um, with, with the Holy Spirit in, in all actuality, and he feeds them with bread and water, and bread speaks to, you know, uh, our Messiah, and water speaks to counsel, you know, because we know our Messiah is the bread of life, amen. You know, so here it is. We see a beautiful picture of the servant of Yah, you know, during a time of, of great peril for the prophets of Yah. You know, he hides them in the Ruach HaKodesh, you know, and feeds them with bread and water, with the teachings and instructions of our Messiah, Yahshua, and with Elohim's counsel. It's a beautiful picture. I pray, pray you all can see that. You know, uh, moving on, we have verse 5, which says, And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all the fountains of water and unto all the brooks, peradventure 
we may find grass to save the horses and the mules alive, that we lose not all the, be all the beasts. Okay, so now here it is. We see another dynamic to this, to this time, you know, and it is that, you know, um, during the time of this great famine, it's in the third year, you know, that uh, food is very scarce. You know, food for the animals um, even is scarce. And we know they eat some of everything, you know. Um, and here it is, it says, you know, he's telling Obadiah to go into the land unto all the fountains of water and to all the brooks. You know, and the fountains and, and brooks have a significance in Scripture. In Proverbs 13, um, I'm sorry, 18.4, we read, The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters. So again, we see that, speaking to that counsel. And the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. You know, so he's, he's uh, trying to send, he's trying to send Obadiah over to the fountains and, and to the fountains of water and to the brooks, you know, um, because, you know, he's looking for grass. And we're going to get into the grass momentarily. Also, we have um, Proverbs 13, 14 that says, The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. You know, and so here it is. We're seeing some spiritual significance to to him sending them to these fountains. He's sending the servant of Yah over to the places where Yah's counsel is. You know, uh, going to the places where Yah's wisdom is. You know, we have Yom Yahu 2, 12, and 13. It says, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith Yahuwah. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And this is truly what the people had done then, and this is truly what they have done today, you know, in all actuality. You know, and Yahuwah is saying that they have forsaken him who is the fountain of living water. Okay, so here it is. We see Obadiah, he was going to, to those who were wise. He was going to uh, those who had wisdom and were, uh, whose mouth, you know, spoke wisdom and looking for the grass. He was going to Yahuwah's people, you know, for Yahuwah is the fountain of living waters. He was... Uh, Proverbs 14, 27 tells us the fear of Yahuwah is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So he was going to those who feared Yahuwah. Proverbs 25, 26 teaches us a righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. So we see here that um, the righteous man, you know, is also likened unto a fountain. You know, now, unfortunately, this is one that's fallen uh, before the wicked and he's as a troubled fountain. And, you know, in this this word trouble, uh, I think it's shakar, and it actually is. It is. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's like shakar. I forget the number, but it, it means like muddied water. You know, so a righteous man is falling down before the wicked is that muddied water in a corrupt spring. You know, you don't want no mud in your water. I mean, you want to keep it clean. And again, you know, verse five of First Kings. It's, it speaks of Obadiah going into the land to these fountains. You know, we just learned that spiritually speaking, the fountain speaks to uh, the wise. It speaks to those, those who fear Elohim. And it even speaks to the living waters of Elohim, which we know um, flow from our Messiah's belly as well as those who followed him. Amen. You know, now they're going to them that they might peradventure find grass. And spiritually speaking, um, and scripturally speaking, grass typifies the flesh. Which, hence we read in Yeshayahu 46 through 8 and 1 Peter 1, 22 through 25, how grass is being likened uh, to people. Come on, next reader, read Yeshayahu 46 through 8 and 1 Peter 22 <coughs> through 25, please. And the voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodness thereof is as the flowers of the field. The grass withered, the flower faded, 
because the spirit of Yahuwah bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of Elohim shall stand forever. Seeing ye have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfortunate love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of Elohim, which liveth and abideth forever. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withered and the flower, therefore fadeth away. But the word of Adonai endured forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Hallelujah. Okay, so here it is. We see that King Ahab sends a servant of Yah into the land to find the fountains, those who are who are wise um, in the word of Elohim, and uh, representing the fountains and the brooks, that they might find grass. And hereby we learn that grass is likened to all flesh. It says, you know, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And as and all the goodness thereof is as the flower of the field. It's going to wither and it's going to fade away. Surely, the people is at this grass. You know, also, they believe that which they follow, you know, and they think that they're serving the eternal king. They think that they have the truth. You know, and, and they think that they're, you know, enduring the test, you know, for, uh, for their final destination. And they think that they have the Holy Spirit. So, I pray you can see the picture that's going to be taking place. You know, even the picture right now today. You know, many, many um, self-professed Christians believe these things. They believe that they have the truth. They believe they're serving the eternal king. They believe that, that, they're, they're, being, um, that they're being set up, you know, and what they're doing is, you know, for, uh, for, for their final destination. They believe they have the Holy Spirit. You know, but Eliyahu being only one bears the number of Elohim and the true unity with Elohim. You know, but these other prophets, they're so convincing and there's so many of them. See, and so many people are swayed by numbers. You know, so many people say, well, you know, well, how can all these people be wrong and just this one guy be right? Really? You mean to tell me everybody wrong? These 450 prophets, the other 400 prophets of uh, uh, the Groves, and all of them are wrong, and just, just he's the only one who got it right, right? You know, that's the same way that they look at us. That's the same way that they, that, that they um, adhere to us when we're trying to share the truth of Yah's word to the people now today, is it not? Same thing, you know. You want me to believe that all these two billion Christians got it wrong. But you and your little cult got it right. <coughs> same thing. Very much the same thing. Verse 23 of 1 Kings 18 says, Let them therefore give us two bullets. And let them choose one bullet for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullet and lay it on wood and put no fire under. Okay, so here it is. You can understand how the people could be perplexed. Even as many other people now today are perplexed. They don't know which one to believe. You know, but... They have the numbers on their side. You know, everybody's doing it. So, Eliyahu says, okay, I have a solution. Yah, this is what Yah has told me to do. We're going to take two bullocks. Now, the bullock typified the house of Yosem. Hence, it was Ephraim's standard. You know, it, it represented Israel in all actuality. 
because Ephraim became the, the king over Israel. And all the, the, the kingdom will always pass down from one Ephraimite to, to the next Ephraimite for the most part. Same as we saw with the um, house of David um, in Judah. Okay? Now, Eliyahu is trying to get Israel to either fully give or sacrifice themselves to Yah or Baal. See, and, see, once you understand that the bullock actually represents Ephraim or Israel, you know, you can see that what Eliyahu is trying to do, he's trying, he's trying to say, okay, we have two bullocks here. We have, they both represent Israel. We have one that represents their sacrifice to Yahuwah and the other one that represents their sacrifice to Baal. Okay, so we're going to put both of them on the altar and let the one that Yah answers be the true Elohim. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but um, here it is. We have some passages that speak to the house of Joseph representing the bullock. Deuteronomy 33, 13 through 17, it says, And Yosef, and of Yosef, he said, and this is the um, prophecy that uh, that Moshe gave to the houses of, um, to the different uh, uh, tribes of Israel before he died. It says, Blessed of Yahuwah, of Yosef, he said, Blessed of Yahuwah be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that coucheth beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come upon the head of Yosef and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are um, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim and are the thousands of Manasseh. So here it is, we have the two horns on the bullock, which is the house of Yosef which ultimately, we know Yosef was a type of Messiah, which ultimately will bring salvation unto Hallelujah. all of Israel, Hallelujah. who was separated from his brethren. Yes. And here, hence we see the prophecy that they will be separated from their brethren again. You know, they will be pushed, um, they will push the people together to the ends of the earth. And this is exactly what happened. You know, Yah sifted them to the ends of the earth, to the four corners of the earth. You know, we had one horn on one side, Ephraim, and the other horn on the other side, Manasseh. And this truly came to pass. We can read about it in Scripture. Then we have Yermiyahu, 31, 18 and 19, that's speaking to even after they've been pushed to the four corners of the earth. You know, and Yah says, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus, thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Now, this word unaccustomed um, actually speaks to not being taught. It speaks to not being taught. So here it is, he's saying, I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself, thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised as a bullock not taught the yoke. See, and that's the whole thing. See, because the corruption came into the kingdom of Israel so early, even during the time of uh, Jeroboam, it came in so early, you know, that many of the people from that point were never taught the yoke of Elohim. They were taught a different faith, if you would, you know, a mixture of stuff. Some of it came from, um, was true of Elohim, and some of it wasn't. It goes on to say, Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art Yahuwah my Elohim. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth. See, now you have two bullocks. 
you have one bullock who is like early Israel. And at, like early Israel, they have been pushed to the four corners of the earth. And like early Israel, you know, they, they're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping these pagan gods. You know, but you have a second if, uh, Ephraim who have accepted Yahshua, you know, and they're beginning to be taught the yoke, even in the yoke of Yahshua, which is light, and the burden of Yahshua, which is evil. See, they're beginning to be turned. They're beginning to be turned for Yah. Surely, they're beginning to repent. They're beginning to be ashamed of the wickedness that they've been walking in. Even confounded. Because they're looking back on their youth and saying, wow, how far I've strayed from the will of my Elohim. First Kings 18, 24 through 26. My next reader, please. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of Yahuwah, and the, and the Elohim that answereth by fire, let him be Elohim. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put on put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so here it is. Eliyahu, Yah has given him the solution. He says, okay, we have these two bullocks here. You take one, I take one. And call ye on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of Yahuwah. And the Elohim that answereth by fire, let him be Elohim. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Can we say that now today? Can we say that? You know, this is a sure test. Can we say that, you know, the sacrifice that we put on the fire, let the Elohim, that answer by fire, by fire, let him be Elohim? That's still, that's still a good word now the day. And Eliyahu said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods but put no fire under. You know, so he gave them, you know, the chance to go first. And they have been going first. From way back when, even unto now, they've been going first, okay? And it says in verse 26, and they took the bullet which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning, even unto noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. You know, they still been leaping on that altar. They still have Israel on that altar. They still are calling on the name of Baal. And there still is no fire. But the Elohim that answereth by fire, Hallelujah. let him be Elohim. You know, I want to present to you the next bullet, the bullet that Eliyahu uses. The bullet that whose El is Yah, who uses. Romans 12, 1 and 2. It tells us, I beseech you, 
Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Elohim, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. This is what the bullock of Eliyahu looks like. It looks like you and I. It looks like those of us who are willing to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. It looks like those of us who are willing to be not conformed to this world. It looks like those of us who are willing to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Yes, hallelujah. That we might prove yes. what is good and acceptable and perfect yes, hallelujah. to Elohim. Now, I have you know that each sacrifice had to be salted. Hence, in Mark 9, 49 and 50, we read, For every one shall be salted with fire, speaking of the sacrifice, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace. One with another. Yes. You know, I was doing some research, you know, um, on the culture of Israel, and I learned something new about the salt that really opened my eyes, you know, to the way it's utilized in Scripture. You know, yes, salt is, is noted for its preservative properties. Absolutely. Yes, salt is noted for its flavor. Absolutely. See, but there is another aspect of salt that is little known to those of us of the Western world now today. And that is that the use of salt as a catalyst for fires. You know, during the biblical times, it was the young girl's job, and I know this is going to sound gross, <laughs> but it was the young girl's job, they were to go around and they were to take the poop of the animals, such as the cattle and the horses, and what they would do is that they would make little patties out of them. And then they would salt them. And the salt would dry them out. And that's what they used as fuel in the ovens. They used that to start the fires in the ovens. You know, I was thinking about that and I was like, wow, that's huge. See, because without that understanding, this part of verse 50 don't really make sense. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, the salt doesn't, doesn't lose its saltiness. But it does lose its ability to start fires. It does lose its ability to be a catalyst for fires. And when it had, and what they used to do, right next to the oven, they used to have a block of salt. You know, for that purpose. But once that block of salt has had lost its, its, its um, ability to be a catalyst for the fires, then they literally took it and threw it away. And it was just trampled underfoot. Hence, in another passage concerning salt, you know, Yah would say, you know, that if the salt lost its salt, it's, it's not even fit for the dung hill. See, you can't even use it for the dunghill. You can't use it to make the patties. That it might be utilized as, that the um, dung might be utilized as fuel for the ovens. It wasn't even good for that purpose no more. But to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. They used to use it to throw it in like the mud and stuff, you know, so that they can have, the animals and, and themselves can have footing. You know, when it lost its saltiness. 
You know, so here it is. We see that the bullock that's likened unto Eliyahu's bullock speaks to those who are willing to present their bodies as living sacrifices, those who are willing to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, those of us who are willing to be salted with fire. Also, we read in Hebrews 12, 29, it says, For our Elohim is a consuming fire. No fire, no Elohim. No Elohim, no fire. Hence, the false prophets of Baal are still trying to get fire without Elohim. See, but they can't get fire without Elohim for the same reason they can't get Elohim without the fire. Because Elohim is a consuming fire. Yoganon 3.16, Yoganon answered saying unto them, and this is speaking of Yochanan and Mercer, answer saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than, than I cometh. The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with holy um, ghost or ruach hakodesh and with fire. The fire that came down from heaven. That lit a fire to Eliyahu's sacrifice to his bullock was even our Messiah, Yahushua. Luke 12, 49 through 53, I am come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. For from hence there shall be five in one house, divided three against two, two against three. The father shall be, uh, be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, and the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And that's the way it is yes, now today. Yes, yes. You have those of us who, who walk in the ancient paths and we're at deference with our families and friends, with those even of our very own household. Yes. Our faith has brought division. Yah yeah. has sent a fire yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. under the sacrifice. <laughs> that fire has come from the heavens. And it has ignited the sacrifice. Unless you forgot, we're called to be the bullock. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We in the flesh. Those of us who are willing to be sacrificed, those of us who are willing to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We're the ones that the fire is to consume. We're the ones that our Elohim, the consuming fire, is to consume. Hallelujah. In 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, we read, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season. If need be, ye are in heaviness through manyfold temptations. See, this is, this is, he's talking about the believers of this time. See, but unfortunately, some people get it misconstrued and think that the believers of his time are somehow supposed to be different than the believers of our time. Mm -hmm. You know, but they aren't. It's the same book. Mm -hmm. It's the same fire. It's the same fire that came down from the heavens that ignit, ignited Eliyahu's sacrifice that is to ignite our living sacrifice. It's the same one. Even Elohim, the consuming fire. See, when we speak of rejoicing in the, in the Brick Hadashah or the New Testament, we speak of being persecuted for righteousness sake or persecuted for Yah's name's sake. You know, for in Matthew Yahoo 5, our Messiah said, Rejoice, be exceedingly glad when you're persecuted. Yeah. So here it is in, in 1 Kings 1 6, it says, We're in the Greatly rejoice now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manyfold temptations. See, this is part of it. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith, 
being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. See, our faith must be tried with fire. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Yahushua Messiah. He re reiterates this, this, um, this notion in 1 Kephas 4, 12 through 16. He says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Messiah's sufferings. Yeah. That's something to rejoice about. Yeah. Hallelujah. But the people of the world, they get depressed about it. They get upset about it. But if you being persecuted for his name, say you have something to, to be joyful about, something to rejoice in. Hence, keep us saying, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Messiah's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Messiah, happy are ye. When your family and friends, when they, when they reproach you for the name of the Messiah, when they reproach you for walking in truth, when they reproach you for yeah. walking in the yeah. will of Elohim, when they reproach you for walking in scripture, happy are ye. Yes, hallelujah. For the spirit of glory and of Elohim rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Yeah. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Or as a thief, yeah. or as an evildoer, or as yeah. a busybody in other yeah. men's matters. See, because this is not of Elohim. All this is against his teachings and instructions. All this is against his commandments. His Torah. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, as one believing in the Messiah, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify Elohim on this behalf. Mm -hmm. Praise Yah for the fire. Glory, glory. See, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the fire that consumes the sacrifice. As Eliyahu, we don't put the bullet on the altar. We're calling on Elohim to send the fire. But when he sent the fire, some of us want to jump off the altar. <laughs> you can't do that. <laughs> Again, 1 Kings 18, 24. And call ye on the name of your gods. Whoever they may be. Whether it's Baal, Ishtar, Buddha, Allah, whoever you want to call them, whoever it may be, put your sacrifice on the altar, your living sacrifice that's supposed to be holy and acceptable, and see if it's accepted. And I, I, Obadiah, for one, I will call on the name of Yahuwah and the Elohim that answer him by fire. Let him be Elohim. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. If you truly want to walk this thing out, this is how you do it. Hallelujah. And the true Elohim will answer by fire. Hence we read, all that suffer um, persecution, all that live godly shall suffer persecution. As I say, oftentimes it's built in. Elohim will answer it by fire. That's all I have for you today. Pray with a blessing.